a little while since we've uh, been together in just a normal service and uh, had a wonderful time. D did you have a good time in the missions conference? No. Man, it, it, it's always good, as I said then, and uh, I'll always say to have our missionaries come in. There are our hands extended to the world, and uh, we're always grateful to get to meet them face to face and talk to them. Back in the old days, uh, if you want to know about the old days, talk to Pastor Tim. He knows about the old days. Um, <clears throat> but back in the old days, they used to bring a slide projector and and slides and you know. And this is uh, Mgugu Malugu, and sh this is where we're building a hut here. You know, it was it was different. Now it's so much better, not only because of technology, but getting to be able to meet them. And, and just over the years that I've been here, uh, we've seen a lot of young couples and young families launch uh, out into the mission field. And I'm telling you, these people are not like, not like the old days. These uh, young missionaries that are out there now are incredible. I mean, they're heroes because they just are... They've given of themselves, they are giving of themselves, and they're uh, overcoming a lot. And, and the vision of, that God has put on their heart for where they go and what they do is just, it's incredible. It's not, nothing like uh, ever was before, so we're just so grateful. Um, you know, we're in the last days, and it's time for the gospel to spread out uh, widely. And these young missionaries are doing just that. So uh, thank you for participating and uh, hope you had a wonderful time. Only 12 months until our next one. So get yourself ready for that. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, well, um, so I, as we finished the, the book of John this year, in fact, I was looking back to see and we started that a long time ago. You realize that? Uh, we did the book of John, then we did uh, 1 John, because I figured it had it was a great follow-up. And then I was trying to say, okay, Lord, where are we going next? Well, uh, he kind of led me to messages to the churches, and so we got into Revelation. Revelation 1, uh, of course, is the, the great vision of Jesus that John had, the revelation of, of Jesus, and the description of him is incredible. Uh, and then, of course, in chapters 2 and 3, we see the, the different messages to the seven churches. Uh, we, we went through all of that, and then I thought, okay, the holiday season's coming up. Uh, so next week, I'll probably, uh, well, not probably, uh, next week we'll be talking about thankfulness and gratefulness and all of that. But I figured one more time in Revelation, and as I said at the beginning, I'm not going to attempt to tackle the entire book, but... Uh, or at least at the beginning. And I thought, you know, a great follow-up to what we have done. All the messages to the churches and the way that we can apply those to our own lives and to our own church here. <clears throat> what better way than to see our, our blessed hope, which uh, chapter 4 brings about. Uh, the throne room of God. The throne room of heaven. It's amazing. So, hope you're, you're excited about that. Um, it's, it's a wonderful thing, and so let's take a look at it. So uh, as we get into the book, uh, or excuse me, the chapter of uh, chapter 4 of Revelation, we're going to see some more symbolism here, which Revelation is well known for. A lot of symbolism. Uh, and the symbolism isn't meant to, and this is a note, this is a, a thought, a caution that came to my heart. The symbolism that we find in Revelation isn't meant to take away from the realism of what was going on. You see, uh, it wasn't just that God was given these mysterious symbols of, about this and that and the other thing, and, and uh, these mysterious things that Revelation is known for. Uh, the reason that it's like this is because John, a man like one of us, had to describe in his own way what he was seeing in, the he in heaven. I don't think any one of us could have done as good as John. I mean, he did the best he could, and, it, and it, it's, it's symbolic, and it's, and it's glorious. And so we're going to take a look at that, the, the throne room of God, 
today in chapter 4. Uh, the difficulty of trying to describe the dimensions of heaven in earthly words and understanding is just amazing. And John did the best he could. And so let's take a look at chapter 4. So we're in John chapter 4. We're going to start with verses 1 through 3. After these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you the things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like jasper, uh, or a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Okay, let's pause there. The symbolism, the uh, interesting picture that we see here begins. And so these things, so John has talked in, in chapter 1, uh, verse 19, God, I mean, Jesus told John, uh, or John was told, he said, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, the things which shall take place after this. Okay, so you write what you've seen in the past, write what is, the things he was seeing there, the messages to the churches, and then the things which will follow after this. And so chapter 4 begins all of these future things, these things that are to come after this. Uh, and then there's an open door here. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. <clears throat> Interesting contrast. <clears throat> Excuse me. Remember back in the... Uh, Message to the church at Laodicea. He, uh, this is the famous uh, uh, part of Scripture where he says, Behold, I'm standing at the door and knocking. And if anyone hears me and opens the door, I'll come in. And I will sup with them. I'll fellowship with them. Uh, so in contrast to that closed door that Jesus is knocking on, here there's an open door to heaven. And God says, come up here. Come up here. The re this uh, particular symbolism here uh, is often uh, seen by scholars as this is the, the rapture of the church. Come up here. And I always thought that was a little bit like, well, that's, that's kind of fun. Come up here. But that's, that's what it is. Uh, come up here. Uh, because one, one reason for this is that the word ecclesia or church doesn't appear in chapters 4 through 19. We're talking all about the tribulation. Now, I realize that there's a whole lot of different opinions and views on when things happen and how they happen and all of this. And Will the church go through the tribulation or will we be taken out before and all of this? Well, in my particular opinion, my understanding is that we will be taken out before the Great Tribulation. And at this point, uh, we believe that chapter 4, John is seeing that the, it's the, the rapture. Uh, come up here. Come, come out from them here. Uh, the rapture of the saints, the second coming, all these things. Like I say, uh, there's a lot of different views on this. But one thing we need to understand is that the rapture and the second coming are not the same thing. You realize that. The rapture is when the saints or the church is caught up into heaven. And the second coming is when Jesus comes and every eye on earth is going to see. And he's coming with his saints. And so uh, that would be us, those who were with him. We're going to come with him when he comes back. And so there's a difference there. Uh, need to understand. I'm not going to go into all the details about that. But that's how that goes. Um, and then he says... Uh, the first verse, or excuse me, <clears throat> I guess I do need this water. The first voice, which I heard, was like a trumpet speaking to me, saying, come up here. The first voice. Well, who was the first voice that he heard? It was Jesus. And so Jesus is speaking again. It's clear and as bright as a trumpet is how he describes it. Loud and clear like a trumpet. It, it reminds us of in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15-17, where it says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, this is Paul writing, <clears throat> that those who are alive and remain 
until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So another picture of the rapture. And then 1 Corinthians 15. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. Are you looking forward to your glorified body? Body that doesn't hurt anymore? Body that's not sick anymore? Uh, it's going to be an amazing thing. Uh, I agree with you. <clears throat> So John hears this voice, this voice of Jesus, and it sounds clear and bright like a trumpet. And he says, come up here. <clears throat> so he says, immediately as I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven <clears throat> and the one who sat on the throne here. So it's the description of the, uh, well, let's see, the one on the throne. So if he's on the throne, it signifies power and authority and majesty. Of course, we know that's, that's God. And it describes, uh, here it says that the one on the throne sat there was like jasper and sardius stone. Okay? Uh, again, symbolism. John is trying to describe the glory that he's seeing. The shining, bright glory coming from God. And he said it was, it was like these precious stones. The, the, not that the one on the throne was made out of stone, but the one on the throne uh, sparkled and, and was glorious like, like bright jewels. And so he's explaining here uh, how, he, how it looked. And so now he talks about the throne room and he describes the throne room further. <clears throat> verses, let's look at verses 4 through 7. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their head. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which were the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in the front and the back. And the first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf or an ox. The third living creature had the face of a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest night or day, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Wow. So now we're thinking about this. Wow, John, what are you describing here? He's in the very throne room of heaven. And he sees this mighty throne and this, this glassy sea around. And he sees these creatures and the, and the 24 smaller thrones around it. And these creatures, and he describes these things. And remember that he is, again, with human eyes, trying to describe the glorious things in a dimension that we won't understand until we get there. Uh, the glory of God and the throne room of God doesn't fit in the three-dimensional world in which we live. Amen? Or four-dimensional if you uh, <clears throat> add the, the dimension of time. Doesn't fit here. He is beyond our God is glorious. Our God is beyond all of this. So he's described in the throne room. And he said there are 24 thrones around and 24 elders on the throne. So who are these? Are the angels? No. They're probably humans in glorified state. They're lesser thrones. They're not like the one throne. They're lesser thrones. They're those who rule and reign with Christ. Now, some have speculated Maybe these uh, represent the 12 patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. So that would bring in the Old and the New Testament. So we see the 12 uh, patriarchs of the Old Testament and the 12 apostles, the elders of the New Testament, together. And here they are around this in a, in a, 
a, a place of honor. Not the place of honor, but a place of honor before the very throne of God. Then we see power from the throne. He talks about lightnings and thunderings and voices coming from the throne. Does this, this remind you a little bit of Mount Sinai when Moses went up on the, on the mountain and there was thunder and, and all kinds of noise and the power of God, the, the glory of God was there and there were thunders, thunderings and lightnings and voices and the awe of being right there. Can you imagine the awe of being at the foot of Sinai and this power of God just there, just be like, oh. You know, it, w it would be amazing. It's like an ominous storm. And one commenter said, it could be the, the judgment of the earth that had begun. The great tribulation, only from the heavenly perspective. As, as the thunderings and the, and the judgment is, is now starting to rain upon the earth. And John is there in the throne room above that all and sensing that tribulation that's happening, that has begun uh, on earth. And it says there were seven burning lamps before the throne, which is the sevenfold description of the Holy Spirit, as referenced in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 4. <clears throat> Remember back in chapter 1, verse 4? Um, it says... John's uh, grace to you and peace to you who, from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Okay, so John gives us a hint even in chapter 1 uh, of this. And again, this is the uh, sevenfold description of the Holy Spirit as we find in Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2. He's the spirit of the Lord. He's the spirit of wisdom. He's the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of power, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is spirit, so you can't really see him, but we know we've seen symbols of him, the dove that came and rested upon the Lord, the tongues of fire that came and rested on the saints the day of Pentecost. And here we see this lamp uh, burning, seven lamps burning which represent the, the sevenfold glory of who the Holy Spirit is before the throne. Are you with me? Okay. And, uh, and it says, the four living creatures. Now, <clears throat> if you're looking at the uh, 1611 King James, it says the four beasts. But uh, I've looked through several commenters, old and new, and, and that's not a good rendering. It's the four living creatures, not beasts, like the beast that comes out of the sea and all that later on in Revelation. It's not the same word. It, it, it speaks of living creatures, and these uh, living creatures uh, are thought to be cherubim, angels, and they are indescribable. Why else would, he, would there be all these faces and wings and eyes and all these things? It's just difficult. <clears throat> and again, with regard to Revelation, one of the cautions that we have to have is that, you know, there, there's no way, I don't think, on earth to be able to discern every single aspect, every deeper meaning of every symbol in the book of Revelation. So the best thing to do, instead of going out on a limb which a lot of people have done, is to take what we're given and just take it as it is. And if we don't fully understand something, we, then we say, yeah, okay, we don't fully understand that. But uh, people who have gone beyond have led people astray. We've got to be real careful about that. <clears throat> but, the four living, but before we see the living creatures, we see the sea of glass like crystal. Now, do you think the throne of God there was this actual sea of glass around. <clears throat> Again, John is describing the glory around the throne. I don't know that it's glass. I think what it's referring to here, it's like pure purity, crystal appearance, not, uh, not a substance, but the appearance of the glory of God that John is trying to describe to us. Uh, 
purity, holiness, perfection. Uh, it, it makes us think of a couple of other places in Scripture in 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So, hold, beholding as in a mirror of His glory. I think that's what this crystal sea around the throne is. It's a mirror of His glory. And then in John, or excuse me, James 1.23, remember he's talking about uh, works uh, or no, he's talking about don't be doers only, but be, don't be hearers only, but be doers of the word. And he uses that illustration of it, uh, if you are hearers only, you're like a man who looks into a glass, into a mirror, and then turns away and forgets what he looks like. And again, this is, I believe, uh, another um, kind of idea that God's glory is that mirror that we're looking into. And we need to see ourselves in His glory, in His vision, so that we can be doers of what He wants, that we can be who He's designed us to be. <clears throat> the four living creatures, as I said, angels, probably cherubim. Uh, now it says there's eyes all around. You, now that kind of gives you a strange picture, maybe a, like a poster from the 50s, you know, one of those science fiction things, you know. Um, but what this speaks of to me is that these creatures, when, it's, when he says there's, there's eyes all around, speaks of their awareness, heavenly awareness. They are completely aware all around them. They have knowledge in heaven that one day we will have that kind of knowledge. But these eyes are symbolic of they know they know all these, all of this that uh, is around them. They're aware. Then it talks about the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. And there are so many different things. And I, I really struggled with, how am I going to talk about that? Um, there's a lot of different ideas of what those symbols could mean. And again, they're symbols. And, uh, and uh, we just take what we're given, right? Uh, the, the best way that I can see to understand this <clears throat> is that the lion represents, what is a lion in our, in our world? Lion is the king of the beasts. He's majestic. It's like a, like a king. The ox represents the steady uh, worker, the one who plods on, the one, one who works hard. The man, of course, is God's greatest creation. Uh, we have wisdom. We have the ability to reason. Other animals don't have. And the eagle, of course, uh, speaks of sovereignty, supremacy. So when we see, when John sees these faces on these living creatures, he's seeing like these aspects, these heavenly aspects of not only godly aspects, but also uh, of, of what we should be as well, right? We should be living... Uh, as as in the in the power and majesty of God, we should be humble and consistent. We should be rational, intelligent. We should live knowing of His sovereignty and supremacy before us. In Ezekiel chapter one, there's uh, Ezekiel has a vision of God, and the same kind of symbols are there. Uh, speaking of uh, four faces and the, the same kind of things, where Ezekiel is trying to describe the glory that he's seeing. Uh, with some of the same symbolism, because that's all he's got. So, here we see the uh, throne room. We see the creatures. We see the, the elders before the throne. Now let's look at the worship around the throne. Verses 8 through 11. <clears throat> Again, the four creatures having six wings are full of eyes around, uh, around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. We just sang that song, the Revelation song. And I think that song is to give us a picture of what it's like. Constantly, this worship is before the throne of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Holy, holy, holy is He. 
It's a proclamation of God's holiness. It's a constant proclamation of his holiness. It says, without rest, day or night. Now, we know there's no day or night in heaven. But it speaks to us of, it goes on and on. It's consistency. This speaks of consistency, the worship to the one whom it is due. We don't worship God because we feel like it. We don't worship God because, eh, you know, he answered this prayer today, so I guess, you know. But he's worthy of all praise, all honor at all times, no matter what. Amen? And this, this worship is constantly going on. Now, we're not there. John was there, and he saw all this. But he's, he's, he's telling us what he sees. And that should influence us here on earth. Amen? That should have something to do with the way we live down here. Are you God's kid? Do you belong to the Lord? Well, then that, that influences us. Day and night, constantly, to the one to whom it is due. And we see this threefold repetition. Holy, holy, holy. It doesn't say holy. It doesn't say holy, holy. It says holy, holy, holy. No. Uh, the Expositor's Bible Commentary explains it this way. In Hebrew, the double reputa- repetition of a word adds emphasis. So when God says something twice, that means, oh, pay attention. He's adding emphasis. But this rare threefold repetition designates the superlative... Okay, I'm not even gonna, I don't even know what that means. It calls attention to the infinite holiness of God. Holy, holy, holy. What is it? Remember the number three. There's the Trinity. And there's, you know, all these things. And, and again, I'm not a, a big numbers guy, but numbers mean things in Scripture. Holy, holy, holy. Some have said it's holy as the Father, holy as the Son, holy as the Holy Ghost. It's just this completeness. It's this fullness of worship. And it emphasizes Him. <clears throat> they don't rest, but neither do they. are they tired. They're not unrested. They're not like, ah, they keep praising the Lord, and I, I just got to take a breather, hang on. It, it's not like that. This is a glorified place. This is a place we don't fully understand. As these living creatures is who we're talking about, singing holy, holy, holy. These angels, these cherubim, serving before the throne of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. What about the 24 elders? So they see this. They're right there. John tells us that every time... Did I not read this yet? I did not. Okay. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne. And they're saying... You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist, and they were created. So, by the leading, following the lead of the four creatures, the 24 elders, every time they praise the Lord, every time they say, Holy, 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 the 24 elders fall down before the Lord, fall down on their face and give praise and honor and worship. You know, if the angels worship God, how much more should we? You might say, well, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Spurgeon said this. He he gave us this idea. He said, knowing angels who worship God should prompt our worship also. Do we have any less reason to praise him or thank him? And, and Spurgeon says this, Do we sing as much as the birds do? Yet what have the birds to sing about compared with us? Do we sing as much as the angels do? Yet they were never redeemed by the blood of, the, of Christ. Birds of the air, shall you excel me? Angels, do you exceed me? You have done so, but I intend to emulate you. And day by day and night by night, pour forth my soul in sacred song. So Spurgeon is saying, you know, the birds sing, and they have much less to be thankful for 
and to praise God for than I do as one of his own. The angels fall down, or they worship God, singing, holy, holy, holy. Yet they were never redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I, ha I have been. How much more do I have to worship God for? Amen. The, the, the blessing that we have, Scripture tells us that the angels can only look at, can only look into. They haven't experienced this, and yet they worship God. How much more? How much more should we worship Him? How shouldn't we be like these 24 elders, and if they're worshiping, then I worship as well. And it says they're casting their crowns <coughs> before the throne. The crowns of the elders represent victory. Again, we've talked about crowns before in Scripture. Crowns are not like royal crowns, but they're like the kind of crowns that an athlete would get or, or winning a race or something like that. They're crowns of achievement. They're crowns of victory. And these elders have taken all of the victories that they had, all of the things, the great things that they did, and they cast them before the Lord. They don't wear them around heaven saying, look what I got. But they cast him before the throne. It's not about, oh, look, he's, you know, that's one of the apostles. So, woo, can't, I wish I was like him. No, just like me, he is humble before the one who sits on the throne. There's kind of an equalizing in heaven. No matter how many crowns you got, they're all going down before the, the throne. Why? Because God did it all. God gets all the glory. I didn't do anything. I, I, I obey. I, I've asked Jesus to come into my life and my heart. But all of this is because of God's grace. None of it's possible without him. So all those crowns go down. I think of that. There's a, a Christian group called Casting Crowns. <clears throat> I looked to see if they got their name from this particular chapter, and I couldn't find anything on that. But... Casting crowns is, is worship. Casting crowns before the Lord is worship. Worship Him. So let's talk more about worship. Well, worship, uh, I've heard this said, and I'm not, I didn't find it anywhere, but uh, is another way to look at it is worship. It's where you're giving God, you're telling Him what He is worth to you. What is God worth? God's worth it all. So we're giving him worship. We're, we're recognizing his glory. We're recognizing him. We're giving to him again what he is due. We're expressing his worth to us. If we don't worship him, then do we truly, is he of any worth to us? We recognize that. We need to worship him. Our worship for God is not limited. It's not reserved for any certain day. It's Sunday, so today's the day we worship God. It's 1030 to 12, so this is the hour and a half that we worship God. Our worship to God is not limited to those things, nor is it limited in expression. Uh, Paul defined true worship in Romans chapter 12. He said, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he's done for you. Let them be a living and a holy sacrifice the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person, changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And that's a new, new living version for that. That's why it looks different. <clears throat> worship. Is not any certain one thing, not any certain time, not any certain day. Some people would say, well, worship means going to church. Well, you go to church and certainly worship happens. If it doesn't, then what kind of church are you going to? Okay. Worship happens at church, but that's not the whole definition of worship. It's not limited. Some people would say, well, worship means we're singing songs. Worship is music before the Lord. Well, that's a very important part of worship. I value music very much. But again, that's only part. And sometimes, if we're not careful, that 
music part of it can draw attention to ourselves. Listen to how good I'm singing. Listen how good I'm, you know, I, I did that song without any chord mistakes or anything. That, look at me. That's not worship. Music is certainly an important part of worship, but it's not all there is. <clears throat> Some people would say, well, worship is about personal freedom. Now, we can choose to express our worship physically before the Lord in many ways. The Bible gives us a lot of different ways. You could kneel before the Lord. You could stand before the Lord. You can shout. You can raise your hands. You can be quiet and still before Him. There's lots of different ways to worship Him. <clears throat> Sometimes, however, uh, it can get out of hand. <laughs> it can, there are excesses. People do all kinds of crazy stuff and say, I'm just worshiping the Lord. No, you're, no. So you need to be, I mean, there's limits. I mean, there's, you've got to be careful. Some people will say, well, you know, it's, the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom to act like a nut. No. That means you're free from the bondage of sin and death. Remember when David danced before the Lord? We always say, oh, he was terrible. He was the king of, of, of Israel, and he was dancing in his underpants. No, he was, it, he'd taken off his robes and things. I don't know what he was, but he, was, he, he got rid of things that would get in the way because he had to worship the Lord. Why was he worshiping the Lord? So that everyone could see him and his amazing physique? No, it was because he, was, he wanted to be free to give, give it all to God. We got the ark back. The presence of God is back, and I'm worshiping Him with all that I am. And the people saw that, and they followed that, and they worshiped along with their leader. Unfortunately, his wife thought he was a nut. But, you know, sometimes people will see it that way. Other times it really is true that they're, you're acting like a nut. But you have to be careful with that. But anyway, so there's personal freedom in, in worship. You can worship in different ways, but that's not all. Remember when Paul said, you need to give your body as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice before the Lord. It's like wherever you are, whatever day it is, whatever you're doing, you're, you can worship God by giving of yourself. Um, there's a lack of joy. Sometimes people say, well, if I go to church on Sunday and I'm totally miserable and I'm doing time for God, then I've worshipped. If I go and I'm just miserable and it's terrible and dry and oh, I've done my thing so I have worshipped God. No, that's, that's not. Aren't you glad? I mean, I hope you don't see this. We're not like that here. Man, that's just not worship at all. <clears throat> Were you looking at your... What time is it? When is he going to be done? Uh, or tradition, human tradition. Uh, Jesus spoke a lot about this. He's always talking about, you guys do this, and you do that, and you do that, but your heart is far from God. You're not worshiping Him, you're just doing stuff. Uh, he had a lot to say about that. Even David said in uh, Psalm 51, he said, For you, speaking to God, do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering." Oh, that was part of worship in the Old Testament. But David recognized this next part. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. So whatever you're doing out here, it starts in here. Amen? So worship, true worship. They were worshiping before the Lord. Worshiping before the throne. Uh, Jesus encountered the lady at the well, and they talked about worship. She said uh, to him, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews say that we have to worship in Jerusalem. The place uh, is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour has, is coming when you will n worship neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, you will worship what you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. 
For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The, the woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you is he. Or am he, sorry, am he. Wow. She said, oh yeah, when the Messiah comes. He's going to explain it all. And he says, it's me. I'm telling you now. The true worshipers are going to worship God in spirit, and in truth. True worshipers of God are not just, okay, it's time to raise our hands, time to put them back down, time to kneel, time to stand up, time to, you know, whatever. True worshipers of God, despite all the outside stuff, worship in spirit and in truth. It's on the inside. <clears throat> and then the last verse, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. That brought to mind a song from the old days. Again, talk to Pastor Tim. He knows about the old days. Oh, but you, I think maybe several of you know this song. It's a chorus we used to sing. <clears throat> and we sang uh, today, we sang Worthy is the Lamb. Remember we sang that song? But there's a song that's older and it kind of goes right along with chapter 4, verse 11. <clears throat> Remember this song? Sing it with me if you know it. Thou art... Oops. Thou, thou art the... Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy. To receive glory and honor, glory and honor and power. For thou hast created, hast all things created, thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure they are created. Thou art worthy, O Lord. So that's what the 24 elders were singing. That's how old that song is. It's from eternity. No. Actually, you know, it's all the time. So I guess it's not old, it's current. But you, you hear the words of that. Lord, you are worthy. You're worthy to receive glory and honor and power. Everything I got, Lord, you are worthy of that. You created all things. You created, as the song says, you have created, thou hast created, has all things created. Thou hast created all things. And for your pleasure, you have created. Uh, you are worthy, O oh God. They sing it over and over and over and over. Amen. So that's chapter 4. Makes us think, well, is that, is that eternity then? We're going to be there where John is. We're going to be singing praises and throwing crowns down and that's it? Does this explain our, our whole eternal existence? No. No, this is only an initial view that John is giving us into the throne room of heaven. This is only the beginning. The throne room of heaven always has been, always is, and always will be. It's like the control station of all that God does. But our, what we're going to do in eternity, and we will worship God for all of eternity, but all the specific things are yet to be known. And they're going to be glorious. They're going to be wonderful. Uh, one, uh, well, let's see. Yes, um, Greg Laurie, one of my favorite preachers, said this. Heaven will be a place of rest, certainly. But it will be far from boring. 
we can't even begin to conceive of the activities and opportunities that the Lord has lined up for us. What did Paul say to the Corinthians? No mere man has ever seen or heard or even imagined the wonderful things that God has already prepared for those who love the Lord. John's description of the throne room in chapter 4 is intriguing, but yet it's inadequate because he was limited to his own language, his own ability. Basically, he was telling us the best he could of the glory that he could see, and there's no way we're going to fully understand that from that. It reminds me of that expression, you, you had to be there. John would maybe say that, you know, I'm trying to explain to you, but, you know, you, you just had to be there. You know what? We're going to be there someday. Amen? Again, Spurgeon, he said, <clears throat> but it also means that we should plan ahead for, the great, for that great day. If you and I should walk into some great cathedral where they were singing and ask to be allowed to sing in the choir, they would ask whether we had ever learned the tune. And they would not let us join unless we had. Nor can we express the untrained voices, uh, nor can we expect that the untrained voices should be admitted into the choirs above. Now, dear brothers and sisters, have you learned to cast your crowns before the Savior's feet already? What he's saying here is this. It begins now. You know, we see this worship before the throne. It's glorious. We see these living creatures that you just can't imagine, with wings and eyes and faces, giving glory, holy, holy, holy. See John's very brief description of the one on the throne and just the beauty. We see the 24 elders falling down on their face and casting their crowns and saying, Lord, you are worthy. It's going to be something to behold. But as Spurgeon is, is saying here, start now, basically. You want to join that heavenly choir? You need to learn the song now. Let's worship the Lord. Let's our lives be a worship every day, everywhere we're going. You say, Pastor, that's a big, big order. How can I do that? Because I get grumpy some days, and I, I don't know. Well, I do too. But you know what? He's worthy of our praise anyway. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for these who have chosen to come and spend time with us today, Lord, and those online today. God, I pray that you would bless and that you would help us and cause us, Lord, to be not only worshipers, but, Lord, that we would give ourselves as worship before you. Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy. You are holy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I pray that this has encouraged us, spurred us on. Lord, as we look at our lives and we realize, oh, there's so much more I could be doing in worship and praise to my God. Lord, help us to act on that. Thank you. We love you. We praise your name. Amen. Okay. Well, thank you for being here today. Make sure you say hello to folks, give them a, a hug, and uh, have a wonderful day. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen.